everyone and welcome back to another video in our series in which we are exploring the respiratory system and looking closely at haemoglobin and its ability to transport oxygen and to a lesser extent carbon dioxide around the body. Now where we left off in our previous video was exploring haemoglobin in its R state. So this is when haemoglobin has moved to the lungs and has scooped up and collected as much oxygen as it can, causing that haemoglobin to shift into its R state which is increasing its binding affinity. So remember, binding affinity is the willingness or the likelihood in which two molecules are going to attract and bind together. And that's what we're seeing here with hemoglobin and oxygen. So as hemoglobin pushes towards its R state, it makes it easier or more likely that oxygen is going to want to bind to hemoglobin. Now, sometimes we don't always want that. The above situation is really good when we're looking at the lungs here. This is when we are wanting to pick up and absorb all of those oxygen molecules. But as we leave the lungs and we sort of come down here to the pulmonary vein and we enter into the left side of the heart and enter the sort of the systemic circuit, as we begin to move down here towards the tissues, we don't want hemoglobin to be in its R state anymore because we don't want hemoglobin to hold on to those oxygen molecules. Remember, the purpose of hemoglobin here is to kind of act like the Uber taxi driver. It's all well and good to pick up oxygen, but it kind of needs to drop it off at some point. How does it do that then? How is it that oxygen is able to then leave hemoglobin and then move through into the tissues? Essentially, there are three main parameters that discern or control whether hemoglobin and oxygen will remain bound or whether that oxygen will leave. They are the Bohr effect, which is essentially looking at pH, a change in acidity or alkalinity. The second one is temperature. And the third one, which links very closely to the first one, is carbon dioxide concentration. Now, let's look a little bit more closely at the Bohr effect. What we sort of see here is a nice sigmoidal curve graph. And what this graph is essentially showing us is the change or the difference in oxygen saturation versus partial pressure of oxygen when we're changing the pH. Okay, that's a bit complicated. Let's break this down even further. I want you to look at this center curve here. So this is at a pH of around 7.4, which is what we find our tissues to typically be around. And sort of we can see if we kind of eyeball it at a pH of 7.4, if we have a oxygen partial pressure of 40 millimeters per of mercury, it's around 70% saturation. Cool. Now, what happens if we tweak that pH? What happens if the, we say we, we get more acidic? Well, then... If we look at this graph down here, pH 7.2, if we compare the same oxygen concentration, we can see around or less than 60%. So what this is essentially showing us is that as the pH goes down, or as we are getting more acidic, the binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin will decrease. When we get more acidic in our tissues, it causes the hemoglobin protein to change its conformation, making it less likely for that oxygen molecule to be able to stay there and will be removed from the hemoglobin molecule and be delivered to the tissue. A good way to sort of, I guess, to paraphrase this is imagine we've got a courier driver. So the courier driver has picked up your parcel and has gone to deliver it to your house. But maybe our, our posty driver here, like our, our courier driver sort of missed a day in, in his training and he goes to your front door, but he doesn't hand you the parcel. He kind of keeps holding on to it, which defeats the purpose of a, of, a, of a courier driver. Now, imagine if as the, the courier driver is walking to your house, all of a sudden his hands get really sweaty and oily and, and he can't hold on to that, that parcel anymore. And as soon as the courier driver gets to your front door, they drop the parcel. They go, whoops, okay, well, there it is, bye. And they turn around and leave. Bit of a weird analogy, but what we are seeing here is that as we get more and more acidic, the ability for hemoglobin to sort of hold on to oxygen is going to decrease. Now, as oxygen leaves hemoglobin, it's going to cause that hemoglobin to revert back to its T state. Now, why is this particularly important? Because remember, T for tissues and T state has a lower binding affinity. 
So it means as that first oxygen molecule leaves, it's going to make it easier for the second oxygen molecule to leave and be delivered to the tissues. Now, again, this is all well and good. This is uh, very interesting and, and practical for our tissues, but I guess maybe we're missing a bit of zest here. We're missing the zing behind it. And that is because of this wonderful equation down here. So what this equation is showing is essentially the creation of carbon dioxide and water. Again, why is this relevant? Well, this is a byproduct of aerobic respiration. So your body taking glucose and converting it into ATP, it will produce water and carbon dioxide as a byproduct. What is then going to happen is that carbon dioxide and water will react together with the assistance of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. What this enzyme does is it drastically, drastically speeds up a chemical reaction. So what this does is it takes that carbon dioxide and water and smooshes them together to create a molecule called carbonic acid. Now, there's a key word in the name there, acid. This is a weak acid, which means that in our tissues, in a neutral environment, this hydrogen here is going to be removed. Now, the ability for a molecule to donate a hydrogen, that is an acid. So your body undergoing aerobic respiration, producing ATP, is producing carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And that carbon dioxide is being converted into an acid which makes your tissue more acidic. Okay, why is that relevant? Because by making your tissues more acidic, this makes it more likely that the oxygen molecule on that hemoglobin will be removed and more oxygen will be delivered to that targeted tissue. This is particularly important, especially if you've got a tissue that is under strain, that's under load. Let's say under the rare hypothetical circumstance that I turn around and go for a jog, I go for a run. Suddenly my legs and thighs and chest from breathing too hard are gonna be under a great deal of stress. And my tissues are going to have to work incredibly hard to essentially produce ATP to keep me powering on. This is going to produce more carbon dioxide as a byproduct. My tissues are going to get more acidic, which means that combined with vasodilation and increased blood delivery to those targeted tissues, more oxygen can be delivered to those tissues that need them. So that is in essence the Bohr effect. And that's one of the three main ways in which oxygen and hemoglobin can be sort of separated in terms of that oxygen delivery. So that was one of them. I said at the beginning that there were three. Well, the second point, again, comes back to this wonderful equation that we were looking at. Not only can carbon dioxide be converted into carbonic acid, but we can just have carbon dioxide by itself. And it just so happens we see a very similar sigmoidal curve with carbon dioxide concentration and the ability for oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. In other words, as the concentration of carbon dioxide goes up, the ability for hemoglobin to hold on to oxygen will decrease and increase the amount of oxygen delivery to that tissue which works perfectly for us because generally if we see an increase in carbon dioxide sort of production for a particular tissue, it means it's doing a lot of work. Now, the third of the main three, I guess you would say, factors that control oxygen's ability to sort of stay bound to hemoglobin is temperature. Now, if I go back to sort of my running analogy and I'm going for a jog and my skeletal muscles in my sort of in my legs and, and my quadriceps they're going to be rubbing together, causing a great degree of friction. And as we increase that temperature, again, the binding affinity of oxygen goes down. So what can we draw from sort of these three main points here? The three main things here is that the greater degree of activity that we see in these tissues, especially skeletal muscle, the easier it is for hemoglobin to deliver oxygen to that targeted tissue which is particularly important because essentially what that means is that tissue is under load and it's going to need a greater degree of not only blood flow, but oxygen delivery and carbon dioxide removal. So guys, that is essentially 
T-state. So as the red blood cells with hemoglobin sort of saturated with oxygens moves away from the lungs, again, in their R state, it's going to move around the systemic circuit. So moving sort of around the body and depending on where the blood ends up, if we see a change in pH, carbon dioxide concentration or temperature, it means that that oxygen will be more readily able to leave that hemoglobin and be delivered to the tissues, again, where it's needed most. So in our next video, we're going to actually explore the other side of the coin. We're focused a lot on oxygen transport and how we can get oxygen to the tissues. In our next video, we're going to sort of briefly cover how we can move carbon dioxide and how we can take carbon dioxide and move it sort of from the tissues to our lungs for exhalation. I'll see you then.